for anyone who's ever made a wish, believed in a fantasy, or had a dream. This is The NeverEnding Story. What is anti-Semitism? It feels that my party has given permission for anti-Semitism to go unchallenged. Wouldn't you like to take this opportunity tonight to apologize to the British Jewish community? To accuse him of being a, an existential threat to Jewish life in the United Kingdom is, is surely the worst possible accusation you can level at any respectable politician. How can you justify that? I think some people find it hard to follow the Labour anti-Semitism scandal. It's quite simple. It's a simple story revolving around Corbyn's response to Labour's out-of-court settlement, which was a response to Labour Party whistleblowers' court case against the Labour Party for defamation, which was their response to Labour's response to the Panorama Labour Party anti-Semitism whistleblower program, which itself was a response or criticism to Labour's response, or lack of response in their eyes, to claims of anti-Semitism in the party. Now, if you can't follow that, if you don't understand what's going on there, then that's on you, isn't it, really? Because that's quite a simple process there, right? And the media have explained it very clearly. One of the big criticisms people have of the 24-hour news cycle, the Twitter sphere, and all that kind of thing, is that news events come in thick and fast, nothing gets discussed at length, Stories fall by the wayside, leading to this feeling of weightlessness. No story, big or small, is of any real importance. It's all just content to fill up the endless runtime. But in this case, I think we can safely say the story has been covered very thoroughly. Which is why I think as a nation, we're all very clear with the Labour Party anti-Semitism scandal. We all understand exactly what's going on and uh, who the main players are, what they did and why and what the ramifications have been. We've got a real clear understanding of the narrative there, don't we? Okay, so this is how it was covered on Channel 4 last month. Top of his intray was dealing with historic allegations of anti-Semitism. Historic allegations. Historic. Of all the adjectives you could use. There's been a lot of anti-Semitism scandals in Labour over the years, but this particular scandal is historic. Last year, when Panorama first aired, the then Labour leadership came out fighting. In response, they issued a comprehensive rebuttal statement that ran to over 3,000 words, in which they dismissed whistleblowers as disgruntled former staff with a political axe to grind. Yeah, they just dismissed them in 3,000 words. So dismissive. Now, a year on and under new management, the party has taken a very different tone today. In a much shorter statement, they apologise unreservedly for any harm that was caused during that period. And they say that they've agreed a settlement with former employees that Channel 4 News understands will be worth hundreds of thousands of pounds. It's amazing what is focused on here and what is omitted from this understanding of what's going on. The Labour Party, by settling with these whistleblowers, is framed as... The old leadership were very defensive. They denied these obvious truths about the party. But the new leadership accept that Labour were wrong. And they realised that the best way to overcome this anti-Semitism problem is just to accept that they've made mistakes and not punish these brave whistleblowers, but to give them money. The flip side to that is that what Labour is saying now is that they were anti-Semitic. There was some problem right from the top, from the leadership, that was deliberately slowing down cases, protecting certain members. Surely that's a bigger story. That's, that's incredible, right? Labour is saying that, yes, from the leadership, from the top down, we were anti-Semitic. It was true all along. Do you know who was in that leadership? Keir Starmer. He was part of it. This is, this is a huge story. The problem, though, for... Keir Starmer and Boris Johnson raised it in the Commons um, today is that when others in his party were criticising Jeremy Corbyn on these issues from the backbenchers he was serving as a senior member um, of his shadow cabinet and his political opponents will say as they have done today how can you distance yourself from him now when you have supported him uh, publicly for many years and I think amid all the political rhetoric today he still doesn't have an answer to that question. No, 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 that's not, don't focus on that. Just focus on the fact that Labour are, uh, are moving on now. But if you absolutely have to hark back to the actual anti-Semitism scandal, then focus on Jeremy Corbyn. He was the leader after all. So it must have been him and him alone or him and allies of his that are now not in the leadership. 
Just make sure that the focus is on people that are not in this new leadership, but were in Jeremy Corbyn's leadership. But don't actually say it was anyone in particular. It definitely don't say it was Jeremy Corbyn himself, because that could get us in a bit of trouble. What would be Corbyn's motivation? Certainly not his own personal popularity or success for the Labour Party. In fact, the only motivation Corbyn could have really had was that he's so deeply anti-Semitic himself that he couldn't, despite the public shaming, despite the professional damage, despite the personal hurt, bring himself to speed up suspension and expulsion of Labour members he's never met and never will meet. Which obviously, when you lay it out like that, sounds ridiculous. So we can't really go with that as an argument. We have to just build stories that ignore all counter-evidence, that play down any other narrative, leading casual observers to build this ridiculous narrative themselves in their own heads, without us ever actually having to say it. Because when you say it, it sounds silly, and also it might get you in trouble if you were to put it into print or say it on TV, for example. Isn't it very, very strange that throughout all of this, no one can quite put their finger on exactly what's going on, exactly what the problem is, and exactly how Corbyn is involved. But that big cash payout sparked criticism from one of Jeremy Corbyn's closest allies and biggest financial backers, union boss Len McCluskey, who said on Twitter that it was a misuse of party funds. Like many Corbyn allies, though, his influence is waning, soon to step down as head of Unite. He's not one of Corbyn's biggest financial backers. He's one of Labour's biggest financial backers because he's head of the biggest union in the country. But let's go back to that tweet that Channel 4 put up and then took down too quickly to read. What a disgraceful thing to do. Imagine flashing up text on the screen before people could read it. I would never do something like that. So let's have a look at this tweet. Look what McCluskey writes after the part that she reads out. It was a misuse of Labour Party funds. To settle a case, it was advised we would win in court. The leaked report on how anti-Semitism was handled tells a very different story about what happened. Yeah, so of all the various evidence, whistleblowing, tweets, interviews, recordings that have come to light about the Labour Party's anti-Semitism scandal or crisis in the last five years. The one thing that hasn't been poured over by the media, made headline news for days if not weeks, has been the Labour Party leaks that came out earlier this year. So the leaks suggest that much of the Labour Party, the senior management team, the sort of unelected, for want of a better phrase, deep state within Labour, even during the 2017 election, were attempting to sabotage a Labour win. Now we know when Jeremy Corbyn was elected that much of the PLP wanted to out Corbyn. There was of course the coup, there was a second leadership election. There was the constant undermining of the leader publicly, on the news, leaks to the press. There were leaks within the Labour leadership office. We also, of course, know that in 2019, many MPs left the party, started a new party, joined the Liberal Democrats. One of the reasons they claimed they needed to do this was because of anti-Semitism within the party. And yet, the most prominent Jewish Labour MP, Ed Miliband, did not leave the party. In fact, if you look at Ed Miliband during the Corbyn leadership, you see someone who clearly was concerned with the leadership at the beginning, as many people were. You see someone who was also concerned with the anti-Semitism scandal. But he's not somebody that believed that Corbyn was incapable of handling it, that believed that he had to walk away from the party that he'd been a member of his entire political career, that he'd have to throw away Labour's election chances in 2019 because he thought there was something so deeply ingrained within this leadership that was anti-Semitic. In fact, in many ways, Ed Miliband, after his fall from grace in the 2015 election, positively thrived, gaining much support from the now half a million membership appearing almost like the guest of honour at Navarra's 2019 Labour Party conference variety show. He wasn't popular because he was Jewish, nor was he unpopular because he was Jewish. He was embraced because the way that the party was moving was very much in line with some of the radical politics that Miliband had a background in, and that, perhaps against his better judgement, he thought was unviable when he was leader. Could you have served in a Jeremy Corbyn cabinet? Yeah. You could have done? Yeah. Um, because I think... Because uh, the job would be worth doing. Well, the job would be worth doing, but also, you know, for all of his flaws, um, he was... He and John McDonnell were speaking to something important, which I did not sufficiently speak to, which is the sense that 
you know, there needed to be big change. What, what do I mean by that? Mm. I said, let's cut tuition fees to £6,000. They said, let's get rid of them. Yeah. Um, I think they were more right than I was. Now, the Jewish population of the UK is very small. There were barely any Jewish MPs. And that goes for both the Tory party and the Labour party. A number of Jewish MPs left the Labour party. They cited anti-Semitism. Far more non-Jewish MPs also left the Labour party. They also cited anti-Semitism along with Labour's Brexit position or just that Corbyn was a terrible leader. What did all of these MPs have in common? The fact that they hated the new leadership. They hated the direction the Labour party was going in. They made that very clear from the moment Corbyn became leader. And for a party that's accused of being institutionally anti-Semitic, it's quite amazing that within that party, there is a group made up almost entirely of Jewish people who support the very leadership that's supposedly driving the anti-Semitism. Jewish Voice for Labour have spent the last five years trying to fight the smears made by the media on Corbyn and made by his own MPs. And yet, in all this time, in all this endless coverage, have you ever seen a representative of them on TV? maybe once. As a Jew, I am very aware what anti-Semitism is and I sometimes find that other people don't fully understand it. Do you think Mr Corbyn fully understands it? I think it? Mr Corbyn actually is one of the, the members of the Labour Party who does understand it. Why has your to... party failed to expel anybody for <laughs> anti-Semitic I, As far as I know, they haven't been expelled. So far, the cases that I know about have not been based on on actual evidence. You may know of Professor Moshe Makova, professor of mathematics, Israeli Jew living in London, was suspended with sort of vague allegations of anti-Semitism. There was absolutely no evidence against him. He's a Jew. Uh, it, it's possible, and the, there might be a case with evidence suggesting that a Jew was guilty of anti-Semitism. Well, do you think, well, let's, sorry to interrupt. A Jewish member of the Labour Party being accused of anti-Semitism? As Manson says, it's not beyond the realm of possibility. But it's quite amazing how many of the anti-Semitism allegations have been made against Jewish members. But Ken Livingston has been suspended now for two years yes. for alleged anti-Semitic yes. remarks. Do you think he should be expelled? As a matter of fact, I think he is a very good example of somebody who needs due process. I don't think he's anti-Semitic. I think some of the things Do you think he said his comments were, were about Hitler being I don't Zionist. think they were anti-Semitic. No, I think they were offensive. Right. But the fact that I have a different view than maybe you or someone else just suggests mm. that you have to have proper evidence. Mm. And in my in in the case of Ken Livingston, that is trial by the media and trial by the critics. Well, and the Mr. party Corbyn. could have sorted this out years ago. Yeah. The, Two years it's been going there on. Has been a, there was an, he was given another suspension for a year. I think it hasn't been very, there hasn't been much competency around. Victoria Derbyshire's faux naivety or genuine naivety that the party can sort it out. How could the party sort it out if the majority of the party are attempting to undermine the leadership at every turn? That's why I'm very pleased as a new general secretary. I think the party was hauled into this very fast. The Chakrabarti report is absolutely excellent, but it hasn't been implemented. And I, I, I think that has been a failure of the administration, but not of Mr Corbyn. He is not the boss of the general secretary. It's the NEC. No, but the, it comes from the top. Uh, the no, culture actually, comes from the top. Well, the culture is fine. If it, if it was yeah. important to him, he would have made sure, surely, the recommendations were implemented. Well, as a matter of fact, I've, I've been talking about this before today. The General Secretary of the Labour Party is answerable to the NEC. If Mr Corbyn had said, I want the General Secretary to be a different person or to do this, the criticism of him would be this one that's so often made of him. He's being dictatorial. The left is ruling the party. The report from the Labour Leaks gives evidence that the then General Secretary Ian McNichol was complicit in, or at least had knowledge of, senior figures within the party's attempts to disrupt Labour's own 2017 election campaign. Okay. Oh, no, no, if, no. If, if you appoint someone like yeah. Shami Chakrabarti yeah. to do a report into anti Semitism, yes. which he did, yeah. and then she afterwards was given a peership, yeah. it's important to you. It's it, important it to you. It was very important. So it's why he asked the NEC, as far as I know, I don't speak to him in the NEC every day, to ask Mr. Um, Ian McNichol to implement the Chakrabarti report. It hasn't been implemented. And I was just trying to explain to you, if I may, that no other party has had a Chakrabarti report. No other party has an internal administration trying to deal with an issue like anti-Semitism. And they have made... it's not as bad in other um, parties. There's no evidence. All the evidence at the moment, and there's been an evidence very recently... Um, uh, uh, which was um, sponsored by a Jewish organisation, perhaps expecting different results. They found that most of the anti-Semitism on the far right, there was very little on the far left, and it's mainly about Israel. But it was which never an issue for Labour until... Oh, it was, it no, was. Well, it the wasn't under Ed Miliband. <laughs> I, there was anti-Semitism against Ed Miliband, in my view, from people outside the Labour Party. This is but an he didn't, issue. he didn't 
There was uh, no uh, atmosphere within the party, uh, uh, which uh, meant far, that as online... As far as I know, and there's no evidence, I'm asking for evidence, that mm. things have got worse than the Labour Party. I've been in the Labour Party 50 years. I've never experienced anti-Semitism. I haven't in the last two years You've either. never experienced anti-Semitism? Never, ever. One of the reasons Miliband wasn't so hasty in his judgment of Corbyn's leadership is perhaps because, despite being Jewish himself, he encountered a lot of backlash when he was leader. Here's Anna Kasparian of the Young Turks talking about internal conflicts within the US Democratic Party. Now, what Democrats have been doing in this country for a few decades now is they have leaned in to weaponizing identity, really, identity politics. We absolutely do have a problem with racism and inequality in this country, but they are unwilling to do what it takes legislatively to address it. Instead, they have used... Uh, the topic of racism or sexism, uh, homophobia, whichever issue you, you want to talk about, uh, as a way to destroy their political enemies, as a way to destroy the potential of a progressive candidate who might want to primary an establishment Democrat. And I, I wish that more voters were privy to it because what we're seeing is a complete um, act of negligence uh, by Congress, by Democrats, when it comes to just the basic human needs of America today, of Americans today. One thing that I also want to note is that Nancy Pelosi and Democratic leadership has quite a bit of power. And with that power, they are able to destroy reputations of individuals who speak out against them. I mean, I've seen this happen over and over again when it comes to progressive candidates who choose to challenge uh, you know, these establishment Democrats in these congressional seats. I've seen it happen. I've seen the smears. I've seen the types of disinformation campaigns that come out of nowhere. And the most frustrating thing about it is that the American left, I'm keeping it real, falls for it over and over again. The smear campaign comes out and so-called leftists in America uh, want to be the good guys. They don't want to get criticized. And rather than investigating mm. that story, rather than looking into it and being skeptical, considering where the story is coming from, yeah. they do the virtue signaling online. I see it every day and it's shameful. Okay. Yeah. We're not going to get anything done unless the American left wake up and realize that the sources that they're relying on, the smear campaigns that they're trusting in, are only further dividing us on the left. And as a result, we have no power. We really have no power. But even if the senior management team or the complaints department weren't deliberately slowing down investigations into the anti-Semitism allegations, the fact that much of the party, much of the PLP, were trying to undermine the Corbyn leadership, were deliberately disrupting the running of the party, then at the very least, the fact that the machinery of the party was deliberately not being run properly would surely have an effect on Labour's ability to deal with this problem. At the same time, I sympathise with a lot of people who are not Labour members or not closely aligned with the Labour Party, but would vote Labour, but didn't in the last election because they were genuinely concerned about the Labour leadership, particularly people that read the Jewish Chronicle which of course is a Jewish newspaper, but like any newspaper, it is a political publication and its politics are very, very clear and they're not left wing. In 2018, Morgan Stanley accused Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party of being a threat to the British economy, even though they were one of the main culprits of the financial crash, which was a threat to the world economy. Nevertheless, Jeremy Corbyn released a video saying that he was a threat a threat to huge banks like Morgan Stanley. Bankers like Morgan Stanley should not run our country, but they think they do because the party they fund and protects their interests, the Conservative Party, is in Downing Street. That's why they want to keep the Tories there, because their rigged economy and their tax cuts for the richest work for them. These are the same speculators and gamblers who crashed our economy in 2008. And then we had to bail them out. Their greed plunged the world into crisis and we're still paying the price. So when they say we're a threat, they're right. We're a threat to a damaging and failed system that's rigged for the few. In response, the editor of the Jewish Chronicle, Stephen Pollard, tweeted this. Been hesitating to tweet this 
because I keep thinking it can't be, surely it can't be, but the more I think about it, the more it seems it really is. This is Nudge Nudge, you know who I'm talking about, don't you? And yes, I do. It's appalling. Of course, he received a wave of criticism about this tweet, and so sent a follow-up saying, I accept all the criticism of this tweet and that I may be way off beam, but this is what happens when anti-Semitism is allowed to flourish and when an anti-Semite leads a party. You start to read his every word through that prism, even if the words aren't about Jews. I personally think Stephen Pollard knew exactly what he was doing and he did it in bad faith. However, even if you want to take it at Stephen Pollard's word, what he's saying is that even he, the editor of a Jewish newspaper, cannot decipher what is anti-Semitic and what isn't. Actor Maureen Littman publicly said that although she was a lifelong Labour member, she would not be voting for Jeremy Corbyn. She also said the same thing about Ed Miliband. Before the election, Littman joined Mainstream, a thing which is so bizarre that I can't even give you a better noun than that. Mainstream, which was made up of a ragtag crew of ex-Tory MPs, Labour MPs, TV game show hosts, Maureen Littmans, put out a number of videos before the election, basically telling people not to vote Labour. Because Labour were extreme, not mainstream. The Tories on the other hand, well, you know, let's just not talk about the Tories. Maureen Littman reprised her role as the BT advert woman. I'm not really sure, uh, it's before my time I think, but then again, I don't think this particular piece of propaganda was aimed at me. I still thoroughly enjoyed it though. Ugh, don't ask. Nora, don't ask, because nobody knows who to vote for. Of course we were all Labour. Everybody voted Labour. I voted Labour all my life. You know what my late husband said? If you're Jewish, they gave you your Labour Party badge the day after your circumcision. Definitely not true in Hackney. But this lot, this lot's not Labour. They're not socialists. <laughs> That's definitely the best line in the whole thing. The one thing that you can't really criticise Corbyn for is not being a socialist. You know what they are, Nora? They're extremists. That's what my Melvin says. Nora, Melvin? Who, who are these people? My auntie Dora says that they're socialist democrats, but Uncle Colin, he believes they're democratic socialists. I don't know what to think. And then there's the throwing around of the millions of pounds. Where's he going to get that from? <laughs> she sounds like a real socialist. Where's he going to get the millions of pounds from? He needs to enact the socialist manifesto. Yeah, all that. The straw that's broken my back. I really thought at this point she was going to say anti-Semitism, but no. It's the broadband. <laughs> ah, the broadband. And it is a comfort when you see the disaster that has been the Tory government's response to coronavirus, the biggest recession of any G7 country, and you think, at least we don't have government subsidised broadband on top of all this mess. He wants to get his allotment hands on my broadband. That's a really good line, actually. Quite like that. Oh, Corbyn, you've got soil all over the modem. And the anti-Semitism. Who would have believed that? It's like she almost forgot. I was so wrapped up in the broadband problem, I almost forgot about the small issue of anti-Semitism. This is a kind and a decent country. They will always do the decent thing. Positive racism. Well, if that's the case, why would anybody vote for this Labour Party? Mainstream. We're barely a thing and we represent nothing. What, what is mainstream? What? I never thought I'd say this, but I've got a newfound respect for the Lib Dems actually now. So I don't really know how effective Mainstream's campaign was. I guess we'll, we never will. But it is interesting that its leading light, Ian Austin, and that's saying something, was given a peerage by Boris Johnson this year. What for exactly? For being one of the best Labour MPs of the last few years? Possibly. <laughs> or was it for campaigning against his own party during the 2019 election, which Boris Johnson won? I guess we'll never know either. But I do wonder who Nora voted for. Actually, there's more to this. Right at the very end, Maureen Littman gives Nora another quick piece of advice. Well, I certainly wouldn't. You can do what you like. You want to vote green? Vote green. It's a waste of a vote. Well, what are you saying? Don't vote Labour, but also don't throw your vote away. I think if mainstream had become a political party, they would have cleaned up. 
things would have been very different. Maureen Lippmann in number 10, Nora as Chancellor. Don't worry about the pandemic, my Melvin says we can take it on the chin. Many Labour members are furious that the party has decided to settle out of court. There is much evidence that the Corbyn leadership wasn't to blame. However, Labour has a problem. The actions over the past few years of so many Labour MPs, ex-Labour MPs and prominent journalists are only justified if Corbyn and his team are solely responsible for the crisis. In fact, even Starmer's leadership bid relied on unifying the party, which involved dealing with anti-Semitism, which appeared to many to be intrinsically linked to Corbyn and the left of the party. And therefore, evidence to the contrary is damaging to many key figures in and around Labour. For example, if it is revealed that internal factions hostile to the leadership were deliberately undermining Labour's response to allegations of anti-Semitism and thus fueling the crisis, then a number of Labour MPs and influential, supposedly left-leaning Labour-supporting journalists would be shown, at the very least, to have allowed their political differences with Corbyn, their eagerness to discredit him, to affect their better judgement, as they would have repeatedly confidently and often viciously promoted the narrative that the leadership was to blame, without sufficient evidence and without bothering to investigate, demonstrably damaging Labour's electoral chances in the process. And that is pretty disgraceful for a public representative or a journalist, made all the worse by the serious nature of the allegations. I think it's been absolutely disgraceful that the primary discussion of racism in this election has been the anti-Semitism of 0.1% of Labour members when you have someone like Boris Johnson who has presided over uh, a Tory government that has been responsible for Grenfell, for the hostile environment, who in his own words has said the utterly uh, vile racist things that he has. And I think it, it's, it's a, an indictment of the media of the way they've presented this issue. I think, I think Stephen Kinnock should be reminded of his face on the exit poll at the last election. 266, the SNP on 34. Wow. Lib Dems on wow. Lib Dems. Wow. Lib Dems. Wow. Wow. Lib Dems. I'm not sure what Stephen's face is revealing here, but perhaps he's realising the Corbyn free tomorrow he's been thinking about might never actually come. What we see is the difference between the last election and this election is not Jeremy Corbyn, it's not his personality, it's not his manifesto, but it was the Brexit position and that's something to discuss. But for you to lay the blame on Jeremy Corbyn, particularly after it's your colleagues on the right of the party that pushed him to adopt that position of a second referendum, is absolutely abhorrent. If the party had come together, formed a united front and said, there is a problem with anti-Semitism, but we are fighting it, we have confidence in our leader, we have confidence in our processes, then over time they would have slowly won back the public's confidence and much of the Jewish community's confidence. But it was only the leadership that was saying that. Many MPs were briefing against the leadership right up to the bitter end, saying not enough is being done about anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. Can enough ever really be done about things like this? I'd like to know what exactly Starmer is doing right now that Corbyn's leadership wasn't doing last year. I find it very telling that the analysis we get beaten over the head with about Labour's defeat in the 2019 election was, oh, Jeremy Corbyn, unpopular leader. Anti-Semitism crisis, big problem. Brexit, of course, also played a part. But you'll notice what Starmer is really interested in and is really pushing for and believes is the key to Labour getting back in power is unity in the party. If unity in the party is so important now, is so crucial to winning, then it surely was then as well. And who were the people that were making sure that Labour was anything but unified? The anti-Semitism crisis in Labour certainly was and is a scandal, but what exactly the scandalous element is, we cannot as of yet be sure. 